Okay. I investigate how societies become numerate and literate by using and modifying material forms over generations of collaborative effort. I am interested in the effect this elaborational mechanism has on conceptual content and how material forms become increasingly able over time to elicit specific behavioral and psychological responses. In this talk, I will review the evidence, methods, and issues in investigating prehistoric numeracy. Much of this talk is based on research that will shortly appear in the Journal of Near Eastern Studies and the Oxford Handbook of Cognitive Archaeology. Since I am a cognitive archaeologist, my focus is on the role of artifacts in the historical realization of number concepts. Numbers are perhaps the longest lived cultural system the world has ever known. The roots of our own cultural tradition, the Western numbers, lie in the ancient mathematical traditions of Arabia, India, Greece, and Rome, and before that, Egypt and Mesopotamia. The roots of these traditions lie even deeper in prehistory, in the Paleolithic or early Stone Age, but we still don't know how old numbers might be, or where and why they might have emerged, or in what form. Formally, a number is an element of a mathematical system obtained by extending the natural or counting numbers. My working definition focuses on conceptual content, structure, and organization. So numbers are concepts of discrete quantity arranged in order of increasing magnitude with relations between them and operations that manipulate the relations. However, when numbers first emerge, they don't have all the properties I just mentioned. There's some discreteness, but they aren't necessarily arranged by their size, and there aren't any relations or operations. They instead reflect the ability to appreciate quantity, a perceptual system known as the number sense. The number sense lets us recognize rapidly and unambiguously quantities up to about three or four, an ability known as subitizing. Above that amount, we see many, and we also appreciate quantities as bigger or smaller if the difference is large enough, an ability called magnitude appreciation. The number sense is found in mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and perhaps even insects, a phylogenetic distribution that suggests the ability to distinguish more from less is both adaptive and evolutionarily ancient. Within the order of primates, the number of cents has similar brain function and form. Because of this, the last common ancestor of both chimpanzees and humans would have had the same ability. And this means that ancest ancestral species millions of years ago and homo sapiens within the last 150,000 years would have had it too. The perceptual experience of quantity influences how numbers emerge in language as the subitizable quantities one and two. There may also be a term for three or about three, which can be compounded from the terms for one and two. Quantities above the subitizing range are generally described with a term meaning many. This is sometimes specified further as big many and small many, reflecting the ability to discriminate differences in magnitude. Simply, numbers begin as the quantities we appreciate visually. For its part, language expresses that perceptual experience typically by describing material things that have particular quantities with long phrases like as many as your arms and one, or compounds built of small numbers like two plus one. However, words are not the only way to express perceptible quantity, nor are they necessarily the first. Gesture is also used, making the hand the first coherent or contiguous material form used to represent numbers. The hand also tends to be the material form used to express the first quantity beyond the subitizing range, as many as the fingers on the hand, or five. The hand is so commonly used for this, and at such an early stage, that most of the world's number systems are organized around quantities like five, 10, or 20. The use of the hand is a function of its visual salience, a property it has because it's usually positioned within the visual field. Its use is typically guided by vision, and it's felt internally regardless of whether it's also visually perceived. The hand is also integrated neurally with the number sense. So the ability to know the fingers predicts mathematical ability. Losing the ability to know the fingers means losing the ability to calculate. 
and the ability to appreciate quantity improves when objects are graspable. Gesture lets us express concepts of quantity for which there are no words, either because we haven't acquired them yet or because they don't yet exist in the language. The ability to express quantity through gesture is important because it precedes occasions and supports the verbal expression of quantity, something with no parallel in perceptual domains like color. Gesture also shows the recognition that a set of objects and a set of fingers share cardinality. This is Russell's distinction between cardinality of any set, which is a property of that set, and cardinality shared between sets, which is a number that describes all such collections. The number sense also influences how we use material forms. In these groups, the smallest quantities can be appreciated without counting because they are subitizable. More than about four become increasingly difficult to appreciate. Beyond the subitizing range, we appreciate differences in magnitude, like seeing there are fewer to the left and more to the right. As notations, groups with few elements are subitizable, so they change little over time. Groups beyond the subitizing range are rearranged into small subgroups. They also become difficult to appreciate, so over time they are encoded as bundles or they are simplified as conventional forms that avoid the need to count. Let's look at the linguistic evidence, surprising as that may be to hear from an archeologist. Proto-languages are hypothetical ancestral languages reconstructed from descendant vocabularies, and they provide insight into number words around the Neolithic, the period of rapid increases in population and inventions like agriculture that occurred some 12 to 6,000 years ago. In the Near East, the proto-Semitic word for five is related to the word hand, and numbers are organized around the number 10, with productive terms up to the fourth power. These features show a highly elaborated system of numbers originally based on using the hands for counting. Its ancestor, Proto-Afro-Asiatic, had words for only subitizable numbers, suggesting a critical period of elaboration occurred during the Neolithic. In Europe, Proto-Indo-European words for five and 10 suggest the hands, and there is a term for hundred. A common term for thousand would not emerge until the third millennium BC. These features show European numbers were also based on finger counting, but developed after or more slowly or both than numbers in the Near East. This too is consistent with Neolithic change, which occurred about 2,500 years later in Europe than in the Near East. Now, proto-languages are unlikely to show all the languages spoken in the Neolithic, as some would have gone extinct without leaving any trace. But it's also unlikely that some, and only those we cannot see, had more highly elaborated number systems than what proto-languages can reveal. In some language families, short unanalyzable words for small numbers, meaning the numbers one through five, are highly conserved. When the rate of change is projected backwards, it suggests these words could have existed more than 100,000 years, which is coextensive with some estimates of how long language itself has been around. However, when these words actually did emerge is far from clear. Prehistoric number words also likely began the same way seen cross-culturally today as phrases describing the fingers or compounds built from smaller numbers. There doesn't seem to be a way to estimate how long it takes for long names to wear away to short unanalyzable forms. Such change reflects frequency of use, faster when numbers are used more because shorter words are more efficient and less demanding of cognitive resources like attention. In comparison, infrequent use and slow rates of change are more likely when societies are small and relatively isolated, the general condition prior to the Neolithic. So at some point, there was enough use to turn long names into short words with unusual persistence. But again, this tells us only that small numbers could be quite old. It doesn't establish when they might have emerged. Analyzable number words are also informative. Here are the lexical or spoken numbers one through 10 in Sumerian and Akkadian, two Mesopotamian languages associated with Neolithic numbers. In Sumerian, the numbers six, seven, and nine are compounds of five plus a smaller number, showing the hand was used in counting. 
the Sumerian words for one through four are unanalyzable, as are the Akkadian words one through 10. This suggests something about the relative age of the two number systems. The subitizable numbers emerge first as a function of perceptual salience, typically followed by words for five and 10 as a function of using the hand, and the words for six through nine come later. Smaller numbers tend to be used more often than higher ones. So between their earlier emergence and more frequent use, words for three and four become unanalyzable first before words for six through nine. Analyzability in the words six through nine suggests that Sumerian numbers were the younger of the two systems. The distribution of analyzability is consistent with global settlement. Number systems with no unanalyzable terms for the numbers one through 10 are the oldest. They are omitted here because they obscure the other categories when shown. Number systems whose terms for three and four are analyzable, shown in yellow and red, are younger than number systems whose three and four are unanalyzable in green. Simply, the youngest number systems are located toward the ends of the ancient migrations that peopled the planet. Ancient migrations brought small groups of people into previously uninhabited continents. On arrival, they dispersed across large unpopulated land masses. They had little social complexity to manage internally or externally. And as a result, they needed fewer numbers and used them little. As areas became more populated, resourcing strategies changed and contact became more frequent. This increased the amounts of internal and external complexity to manage and motivated societal investments in numbers. Why do we care about this? As is often said, timing is everything. The global distribution of features like analyzability reflects an emergence that has been timed differently by ancient geographic and demographic factors. This reveals numbers as an ongoing process, one shared across humanity. Comparing number systems cross-culturally in turn provides a basis for understanding prehistoric numeracy as an early but ultimately typical instance of this pan-human creative process. So numerical elaboration is a response to demographic change and the demographic change associated with Neolithic conditions differs by regions as consistent with global settlement. The need to manage complexity associated with Neolithic conditions likely motivated the eventual development of concise recording in the form of written numerical notations, which is why the earliest of these emerge after the Neolithic. Before the Neolithic, numbers would have been represented and manipulated by the technologies that precede written notations, things like fingers and tallies, and they likely wouldn't have changed very much consistent with the relative stasis in populations and resourcing strategies. However, demographic conditions do not necessarily predict how elaborated a system of numbers might be. In 2013, I published an analysis of socio-material complexity and numerical elaboration in a sample of globally distributed traditional societies. I found no instances of simple culture with complex numbers while complex culture was coextensive with both simple and complex numbers. Granted, there are contentious issues regarding how elaboration should be defined and measured in both of these domains. However, the results suggest that socio-material complexity increases first, followed by societal investment in numbers as a technology for managing it. And while simple culture implies simple numbers, Complex culture cannot predict whether numbers are simple or complex. In sum, the linguistic evidence shows the possibility of counting up to five very early and significant elaboration by the Neolithic as measured by characteristics like grouping and extent. If numerical elaboration is viewed as a response to demographic change, numbers would likely be relatively simple at the beginning of the Neolithic and complex toward its end. We turn now to the artifacts. First, we'll look at the kinds of devices used cross-culturally today and how they correspond to concepts of numbers. Then we'll examine the role of material forms in numerical cognition. Finally, we'll review how archeologists interpret artifacts with potential numerical utility. Counting devices are everywhere and their, their types are common across cultures. Devices that accumulate include the fingers, notched tallies, knotted strings, torn leaves, groups of pebbles, 
and marks on surfaces like the, the body or the ground. Devices that accumulate and group include the fingers and toes, collaborative finger counting, the kipu, groups of pebbles, the Mesopotamian tokens, counting boards, the abacus, and sorting strategies. Finally, written notations are a material form that involves some novel neurological reorganizations, ones that achieve a state called literacy and whose acquisition is called learning to read and write. In highly elaborated number systems, symbolic notations are understood to structure and organize numerical concepts in a way that informs both how they are acquired and what they are understood to be. Simply, the precursor technologies used to represent and manipulate numbers would serve the same function. Numerical content, structure, and organization correspond reliably to the material forms used to represent and manipulate numbers, and not just in terms of the organizing base or how high counting extends, but in terms of the properties numbers have. For example, in Amazonian Brazil, Dasana counting extends to 20, and numbers are grouped into four groups of five by the hands and feet. The names of these numbers are long phrases describing combinations of fingers and toes. They are not easy to recite in sequence, and in fact are not known to be used that way in counting. In Papua New Guinea, Aksatman counting uses the body as a tally. The numbers are sequentially named, and they are related to each other ordinally by their order within the sequence. They lack the relations needed for Western style addition and subtraction. In Africa, Yoruba counting uses cowrie shells grouped into piles and bundles. Numbers are dynamic arrays, so the number 600 can be expressed in a completely well-formed fashion as 50 in 12 places, 60 in 10 places, or 100 in six places. And in the Pacific, Polynesian counting sorted every 10th item to create piles that meant tens, then hundreds, and then thousands. And they counted with singles, pairs, and fours as the enumerated object. This created both exponential structure and different sequences for counting different types of objects. Now, there are two ways to think about cross-cultural variability in, in numerical content, structure, and organization. In neurocentric explanations, the brain is the locus of conceptualization. At some point, and no one has been able to explain exactly how or why, brains in some but not all societies conceive numbers and material forms like tallies and tokens with a variability that is also hard to explain, except as the range of things the human brain can potentially do. Simply, the brain does all the work, sometimes it does things differently for reasons unknown, and sometimes it externalizes its mental content to material devices. Another way to model numeracy starts from the facts that the number sense and symbolic notations are material forms we interact with manual visually, that is, by means of our hands and eyes. In between the number sense and symbolic notations are the hand as a device and other devices that we also interact with manual visually. In this model, numerical conceptualization starts with the perceptual ability to appreciate quantity and a world of appreciable quantity whose material substance can be altered in ways that bring forth meaning. Essentially, new devices add new properties, making the addition of new devices the mechanism of numerical elaboration. Once the hand becomes involved in counting, numbers gain linearity, discreteness, and stable order. Tallies add capacity and persistence, while tokens and abaci add manipulability, grouping, and more numerical relations and operations. Notations add concision and a long list of other properties and opportunities. The addition of new devices is motivated by the limitations of previous devices. For example, fingers have limited persistence and capacity, which a tally provides. Tallies are fixed and notches are visually indistinguishable in higher quantities. So a movable technology like tokens adds manipulability and grouping. Finally, tokens aren't very concise or fixed, so they have little ability to compile and display numerical data in any significant volume, something that requires the concision that notations provide. Material forms tend to be good at representing or manipulating, but not both. Consider the tally. Notches are easier to make than they are to move or remove, so a notched tally is good at representing, but not manipulating. 
Compare this to the abacus. Beads are easy to move, but every time one is, the number being represented changes. Plus, as long as it represents any particular number, the abacus is tied up and cannot be used for manipulation. So the abacus is good at manipulating, but not representing. Sequences of material forms appear in part to be a dialogue between the capacities and limitations of the material devices used for representing and manipulating numbers. Using material devices creates habits and expectations that inform the selection and use of new devices and transfer structure between them. New devices are selected because they can do what older devices can do while addressing their limitations in some fashion. New devices also bring new limitations that may eventually motivate the incorporation of even newer devices. And new devices provide opportunities for material properties to be, become conceptual properties of numbers. Essentially, the number sense and the hands provide a common starting point. Then the recruitment of devices is systematized and habituated by what devices can and cannot do. These factors yield highly similar outcomes in numerical elaboration cross-culturally and explain why device types are cross-culturally common and why device sequences are internally consistent in their, interplay of inter in their interplay of capacities and limitations. Numerical elaboration and cross-cultural variability become matters of whether devices are used, which ones are used, and how they are used. When it comes to how a particular device is used, Different social groups have opportunities to make different decisions at various points. Consider the hand, a device that is physically and neurally identical across cultures and time. The idea of a handful can be used, and the hand can be used without counting the fingers or with the fingers counted individually. Numbers higher than five or 10 can be counted using the body like an ungrouped tally or by adding the toes to group numbers by fives and twenties. The hands of the same person can be cycled again, either by remembering the number of cycles or by designating particular fingers to keep track of the tens, hundreds, and thousands. Finally, multiple people can collaborate, either with their hands being used to extend how high the tally can count, or with one person keeping track of the tens, another the hundreds, and a third the thousands. This variability adds to all the other variability found in finger counting, like whether the fingers are used or the spaces between them or the segments, joints, or tips, whether or not the thumb is included and whether the fingers are seen as additive or subtractive. These combinations influence productive grouping in amounts like four, five, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and 20, as well as verbal expressions for numbers like eight that add three to five or subtract two from 10. Other decisions with perhaps less influence on numerical structure include whether to start with the right or left hand, whether to use anatomic or spatial symmetry, which finger to start and end with, whether fingers are extended, bent, tapped, or shaken, and when counting shifts from one hand to the other. Using the hand as a material device for counting also influences properties like linearity, sequentiality, and discreteness. Linearity and sequentiality are functions of the topographical layout of the portions of the brain that control hand movement and sensation, plus the visual experience of the hand as a physical device, plus the fact that finger counting requires less attention and is more reliable if the hand is used the same way every time. Remember that the upper end of the subitizing range is about three or four, that is, it's fuzzy. But it's difficult for about three or four to remain fuzzy once the hand becomes involved in counting. Three and four become discrete when represented on adjacent fingers. Tallies are cross-culturally common, particularly as sticks with notches on them. Notched sticks and forms like knotted strings, piles of stones, and stripes painted on the body all have the same basic function, which is accumulating. However, no society known starts counting with a tally in any form. Instead, people use gesture and verbal descriptions of objects with quantity, and they use the hand as a material device. A tally as a device that is not part of the body is reasonably motivated by the need to do what the fingers do in accumulating while recording numbers longer than what the hand can provide or counting higher than what the hand can afford or both. <laughs> 
Material forms that are not part of the body are a powerful mechanism for accumulating cognitive effort and distributing it between individuals and generations. Granted, this is a grandiose claim for the humble tally, but let's compare the tally to finger counting, a social behavior that new individuals learn to recreate with good fidelity. However much the hand is used for finger counting, its form doesn't change in response to the behavioral and psychological changes that users acquire through practice. Yes, the hand can and will become more skilled under conditions of sustained use in things like hand-eye coordination, but it won't acquire additional fingers, nor will the fingers change in their length or spacing to form a numerical code. Only material forms are capable of such dynamic morphological change, and that change responds to use in a way that emphasizes and intensifies usable features. Change under, change under use enables material forms to accumulate behavioral and psychological change and distribute it to new users when they learn to use the material form. The process can be seen with notations, both numerical and non-numerical. Here, behavioral and psychological change is called literacy and its acquisition is called learning to read and write. An extended discussion of how literacy emerges and how the written form accumulates and distributes multi-generational behavioral and psychological change is beyond the scope of this discussion, but it will suffice to say that earlier forms require less training, while later forms cannot be used without training and the specific neurological reorganizations acquired through practice with the material form. It's this change in the material form over time and the way it reflects and distributes change in behaviors and brains that is the process of interest. Material devices systematize the process of elaboration so thoroughly that by the time a society is using written numerals, variability has decreased significantly as attested by the fact that all known numerical notation systems fall within only five main types. As numbers elaborate, representation becomes more concise. Representing the number 75 takes the hands of eight people, but 75 notches on a single tally, seven tokens, three cuneiform signs, and two Western numerals. Concision increases the volume of data that can be brought together for simultaneous visual inspection, which increases the likelihood that relations and patterns will be noticed. Concision is achieved by minimizing the information that is explicitly represented and increasing the implicit knowledge the user must supply, things like sign meaning and place value. This means the need for training increases. And as material forms are added, numbers become distributed over them. That is, new devices do not replace older ones, but add to them. This makes numbers functionally independent of any one particular form. Cumulatively, distribution, independence, minimized explicit representation, and a significant implicit component make us focus more on whether or not numbers are specified in terms of an enumerated set than we do on the reference set. That is, we are fixated on the idea that numbers become detached from the thing they, things they enumerate, the essence of the so-called abstract concrete distinction, but we don't ask whether they similarly detach from the material structures used to represent them as concepts. Arguably, they do not. The material objects are always required to represent and manipulate numbers, if not in the immediate moment of calculation, then over the course of realization, elaboration, and intergenerational transmission. Why do we exclude the reference side of the relation that is cardinality shared between sets of objects? Possibly it's because we tend to think of cognition as a phenomena of the brain, a construct in which material structures are passive recipients of mental content. With this understanding of the role of material objects in the historical realization of number concepts, how should archeology, span the science of material culture over time, approach prehistoric numeracy? We start by looking for signs of the requisite cognitive ecology. For example, intentional linear marks not just on isolated artifacts, but rather on sufficient artifacts to support the likelihood of cultural encounter. In Europe, this developed during the late Upper Paleolithic, roughly 40 to 10,000 years ago, which suggests that earlier artifacts are unlikely to be numerical. Then, because numbers are strongly patterned by 
psychological, physiological, behavioral, and material commonalities, we look for signs of numerical organization. Differences in attributes like length and spacing, where differences form a code that is not just conventional, but recognizably numerical. We also consider the methods and evidence used. Archaeological evidence is always constrained by what is deposited, what survives, and what is discovered. Potential evidence of prehistoric numeracy is constrained even further. Prehistoric artifacts bearing linear marks are included. However, things like strung beads and hand stencils tend to be omitted, since there are no reliable methods or criteria for distinguishing counting from other uses, a caution we should also keep in mind for linear marks. The hands, gestures, finger counting, sorting and collaborative behaviors, and the ephemeral structures they create and devices made of perishable materials are also omitted because among other reasons, they would leave no archeological trace to even be considered. This lacuna is critical since these are the things used in contemporary number systems and they span the gamut from very few numbers to highly elaborated ones. Finally, archeologists tend not to consider numerical notations as material forms. This too is unfortunate because it further reduces the potential evidence and breaks up the material sequences that can provide insight into what material forms do in the historical realization of number concepts. Here are some of the best known artifacts thought perhaps to represent prehistoric counting in Europe, the Near East, and Africa. Remember that words for numbers up to five might have been available for more than 100,000 years and that concise recording likely developed, emerged after the Neolithic. Most are incised bones, but there are also strung beads and hand stencils and the first unambiguous numbers. We'll start with the first unambiguous numbers, impressions made in clay in Mesopotamia about 5,000 years ago, because they illustrate how a notation can be identified as numerical. The numerical meaning of the Mesopotamian impressions is attested by their correspondences of shapes, sizes, and quantities with later proto-cuneiform notations and cuneiform numbers. These technologies are recognizably numerical. So the question is, what makes a notation recognizably numerical? Here we need to note a fundamental difference in how material forms represent numbers and things that are not numbers. Material forms represent number by instantiating it. Three fingers, three tally notches, three abacus beads, and three vertical strokes in the Roman numeral three all mean three by virtue of having three elements, something that makes precursor technologies like fingers and tallies contiguous with written forms. This has no parallel in non-numerical writing, which signifies in virtue of resemblance or convention. So a sign for sheep is not itself a sheep in the same way that a sign for three is three. The difference between instantiation and signification appears in the earliest writing. Quantity is instantiated, so the sign for one unit is repeated nine times. Non-numerical signs signify, in this case through convention, so only one sign is required to designate the commodity. Besides instantiation, numbers are unique in having bundling relations. That is, lower values are repeated only to a certain point when they are replaced by the next higher value. The highest number of repetitions without replacement is known as the unbundled maximum. Numerical notations either instantiate quantity, like three vertical strokes mean three, or they encode bundling relations, like the circle means 10, identifiable through the unbundled maximum. These distinctive properties mean that numbers can be identified in otherwise undeciphered scripts, like the Minoan linear A shown here. Instantiation and bundling are unambiguously numerical. They are also unique to numbers, that is, non-numerical language does not use them. Some of the earliest numerical impressions are found with small geometric objects made of clay, tokens used for counting before the practice of impressing them emerged. These assemblages correspond well enough in their shapes, sizes, and quantities to verify the numerical purpose of tokens, at least in the mid-fourth millennium BC, when we find them with impressions. However, this same certainty does not obtain for small clay objects that are not accompanied by numerical impressions. And there are good reasons to be skeptical. 
There has been a tendency to label any small clay object as a token, regardless of its actual purpose, and find contexts and prevalence rates do not support numerical interpretations. Small clay objects might just as, just as plausibly have functioned as funerary offerings, game pieces, children's toys, or tools, and there are no reliable methods or criteria for distinguishing numerical intent from other purposes. Tokens thus illustrate the challenge of trying to establish numerical meaning through archeological means alone. Let's look at the prehistoric artifacts and how they're interpreted. We'll start with beads. The earliest are from Blombos Cave in South Africa. They have been estimated as 75,000 years old. These are shells with punctures, wear marks indicating they were strung, and traces of ochre, a body paint. Strung beads have the potential to be used like a rosary, a kind of counting that does not involve naming the numbers or even require them to have names. Beads were widely prevalent in Africa, found at 30 sites over 4,000 miles and more than 40,000 years. However, while many societies make and wear beads, few count with them, and there are no archeological methods or criteria for distinguishing ornamental from numerical use. So while wear patterns can show that beads were strung, they cannot determine whether they were used like a rosary. Hand stencils are also ambiguous. Historically, short digits were thought to be mutilated fingers. However, a 2006 study noted the non-random distribution of long and short digits at Kosker, a site in the Pyrenees. That is from all five fingers extended to all five bent, there are 32 possible combinations of long and short digits, but only five at Kosker, the ones typical in finger counting. Gargus, another nearby site, has 10 combinations, the five that look like finger counting, plus another five speculated to have been hunting signs. If interpreted as numerical, the stencils suggest counting no higher than five, which is consistent with the possibility that small numbers may have been available for more than 100,000 years. However, age and other natural processes degrade stencils, sometimes making it difficult to determine the original digit length, and few sites have been analyzed in this way. Further, stencils appear in various places within caves as made by hands of different ages and genders with right or left hands in red or black paint, and they can appear alone in repetition with other hands or with painted figures. All these characteristics are potentially meaningful, but not necessarily as numbers. Bones with linear marks are of particular interest because they look like the sort of thing that could have been used as a tally. This assumes that resemblance to a modern tally is a reliable criterion, which is risky because for both prehistoric and contemporary number systems, linear marks need not be intentional. And if intentional, they need not be meaningful. And if meaningful, they need not mean numbers. Now, keep in mind that hominids have been making marks on bones for over 3 million years, and that for much of this time, marks would not have had any meaning, numerical or otherwise. The question is when linear marks become intentional and then meaningful, and then meaningful as numbers, and how these conditions might be discerned and differentiated. This is challenging because neither resemblance nor quantity entails meaningfulness or numericalness. Also keep in mind that linear marks can reflect a wide variety of social purposes, not just notations, but decoration, musical instruments, grip improvement, and tools of various types and functions. However, Sets of linear marks do provide the kind of visual regularities important to realizing properties like discreteness, even if they're not numerical. And each artifact would also provide a potential for numerical adaptation. Accordingly, even marks made for non-numerical purposes represent the potential for occasioning and influencing numerical conceptualization. So linear marks can be made both before and after tallying emerges and after tallying emerges, marks can be made for both numerical and non-numerical purposes. How can we tell these apart? Essentially, morphological regularity is assumed to show intentionality, while numerical encoding shows numerical intent. However, when marks are indistinguishable, they do not comprise a code, numerical or otherwise. The challenge for interpreting undifferentiated marks is that they are regular but not encoded, which means intentional, but not necessarily numerical. 
The availability of language, complex culture, and numbers doesn't tip an interpretation one way or another because linear marks are made by both societies with few numbers and societies with highly elaborated numbers. Interpreting such marks has thus tended to match their quantities to natural phenomena and assume that's what they meant. When an artifact has 28 or 29 notches, for example, it's assumed it meant the lunar cycle, and perhaps it did. However, the same linear marks could mean something different depending on whether or not numbers were present and elaborated and whether or not there was numerical intent in making them. That is, meaning cannot be assumed on the basis of mere resemblance, physical or numerical. Marks that are regular are assumed to have been created intentionally rather than being inadvertent byproducts of processes like butchery. Regular marks evenly disposed across an artifactual surface are assumed to have been planned and thus more consistent with a purpose like decoration, while unevenly distributed marks seem to indicate accumulation that is unplanned and perhaps more consistent with quantification. Marks are also sometimes compared to contemporary ethnographic data on notational systems. In these data, notational marks have been differentiated by four encoding factors, element quantity, morphology, spatial distribution, and temporal accumulation. Let's look at the marks on this artifact using that method. There are some differences in morphology as two of the marks are bifurcated However, the minuscule size, about a millimeter for the longer of the two, makes it difficult to argue that the feature represented intentional encoding, and certainly it's nothing recognizable as numerical. There are also some differences of length and spacing. However, the largest difference in either dimension is less than a third of an inch. Again, the minuscule size argues against significance. In the literature, contemporary encoding factors are associated with six so social purposes. However, the two have not been correlated in ways that might permit social purposes to be inferred from the encoding factors used. Further, the encoding factors have not been specified in terms of any numerical encoding, either indicating that there is none in the data, which would be a significant finding, or that perhaps the distinctiveness of numerical encoding has not been appreciated. The emphasis on notations in the data suggests that non-notational marks were not included in the standard, and certainly prehistoric analyses would be stronger if the, if the ability to differentiate notations and non-notational marks was first demonstrated with contemporary data. Finally, the ethnographic data have not been specified in terms of the associated number systems, and things like the extent of counting and organizing base are potentially useful to making inferences about a number system from the associated marks. Marks are also examined microscopically and compared to experimental marks. The goal is determining whether the same or different tools were used, similar in concept to ballistics testing. The same tool implies marks accumulated in a single session, something assumed more consistent with a purpose like decoration. In comparison, different tools imply marks accumulated over multiple sessions, assumed more consistent with quantification. It's a good question where a tool with a retouched edge would fall in terms of these categories. It also seems possible that the same tool could be used for accumulating and different tools to make marks for decorative or other purposes. And it's not certain that either the experimental standard or ethnographic data clearly differentiate the two. And the premise itself becomes questionable when the marks produced by different tools are indistinguishable, except perhaps under microscopic examination, since indistinguishability shows a greater investment in producing a certain outcome of form than accumulation might typically require. The need for making marks for non-numerical purposes before making them for numbers is suggested by the numerical signs invented by the Dasana, a people of Amazonian Brazil after the, their exposure to Western numbers and the idea of writing. These signs leverage cultural images and ideas, as well as the indigenous number system, which counts up to 20 in groups of five. Interestingly, the Dasana didn't use a tally-like accumulation in creating the signs. Though the elements do accumulate, their quantity can differ from the number they express, like the three-pointed sign used to express the idea of four men. Elements are individualized rather than tokenized, 
So each means something different rather than all of them meaning yet another of the items being counted. Perhaps it's not surprising to learn that Asana don't have a tradition of tallying nor of making linear marks for non-numerical purposes. This shows that having number words up to 20 doesn't mean tallying is practiced or that it's easy or intuitive to start even if somebody gives you a similar idea. And it suggests that making linear marks for any purpose might help tallying emerge. And conversely, that where there's no practice of making linear marks, there might not be tallying. Notches don't necessarily mean numbers, even when a society has number words. This can be seen with three Australian artifacts, each about a century old. Notches might be accumulated to aid the later recall of a series of items, likely the case with the topmost artifact, with each notch prompting the recall of a particular enemy. Such mnemonic use might not be numerical per se, but might function as a nascent form of counting. In the other artifacts, the notches have conventional meanings. Conventional use might act as a precursor to tallying, with the practice of making marks for non-numerical purposes being later co-opted for numerical purposes. Nor do the marks necessarily predict the associated number system. Australian languages typically count no higher than three or 10, but it is not uncommon for message sticks to have upward of 30 notches. In fact, large quantities of undifferentiated marks might imply a number system that isn't highly elaborated because highly elaborated numbers come with expectations and constraints. Here's a relatively recent artifact, only 12,000 years old. It contains over a thousand marks, each only one to two millimeters in length, thought to have been accumulated over several years. So a quantity that isn't appreciable through the number sense in a size that isn't easy to see or use in any quantity over a period of time that significantly challenges human memory. Now to our eyes, this artifact looks like it might've been numerical in its purpose and certainly it represents accumulation. But consider for a moment how inaccessible this information is to us. And by us, I mean people enculturated into a highly elaborated system of numbers. We expect numerical information to be accessible because our numbers are accessible, a property they achieve by consolidating and concisely encoding the units tens and hundreds and expecting us to understand the conventions used. Since the information on this artifact isn't concise, we don't find it accessible. Our expectation interferes with our ability to use the information. But the lack of accessibility may be a problem only when accessibility is expected. If there's no such expectation, the constraint disappears. So inaccessibility implies there's no expectation and no expectation in turn implies a number system unlikely to have been highly elaborated. Complicating this view is the Ashango bone, an African artifact 25,000 years old. Its three rows of marks are grouped by differences of spacing into mathematically suggestive quantities something that required planning since marks cannot be moved once made. Row A contains the prime numbers between 10 and 20 in ascending order. Row B contains the numbers produced by adding and subtracting one from 10 and 20. And row C contains halves and doubles, though not consistently. These are complex mathematical concepts, but they're presented without bundling, which means the information lacks the concision that facilitates accessibility. The combination of conceptual complexity and notational clumsiness is difficult to explain. Possibly the mathematical concepts were worked out with a, manip with a manipulable technology and recorded in an unconcise notation. And perhaps the lack of concision is not as great an impediment to mathematical conceptualization as we might find it to be. This highlights the need for more investigation into the way material forms are used in numbers so we can understand what we find and what we should be looking for in the archaeological record. The incised bone from Le Perdel is most intriguing. Beneath a row of nine large marks are two groups of, of four small incisions. The longest of these is about two millimeters in length, the shortest about half a millimeter, and they are spaced less than half a millimeter apart. While they are difficult to see, the need to recount is potentially mitigated by their alignment under the larger marks, which could be interpreted as indicating groups of five. Now, organization by fives is distinctly numerical, 
and moreover implies planning before the marks were made. However, it's possible the small incisions simply represented decoration with the groups positioned and sized to balance one another. Other marks are also apparent in the photograph, perhaps even a third row, but the authors did not note this in the analysis. And if the larger marks indicate groups of five, it's a good question why there are only two intervening groups of four. The time frame, 72 to 60,000 years ago, argues against its being part of a larger cognitive ecology. And certainly the Neanderthals did not produce this kind of object with the frequency or volume typical of archaic humans. Ultimately, this artifact, like all one-offs, remains provocative, especially in its association with Neanderthals, but it is not dispositive of prehistoric counting. So how should we proceed in investigating prehistoric numbers? Researchers often assume that a number is a number is a number, emphasizing similarities while glossing over meaningful differences in content, structure, and organization, both between cultural number systems and within particular traditions over time. Western numbers are at least 10,000 years old, and that's a lot of time for elaborational change. Recently emerged systems are quite different from Western numbers and quite variable as a group. So the prehistoric record is likely to contain number systems that differed, perhaps significantly, not just from today's Western numbers, but from each other as well. We might find amounts of variability on par with that of Papua New Guinea, where cultural number systems include body counting with cycles that range from 12 to 74, digit tally systems with various bases and sub-bases, and binary, ternary, quaternary, centenary, and duodecimal organizations. Further complicating what we might find prehistorically is the fact that a single society might use several counting systems simultaneously. So artifacts from any particular prehistoric site might potentially reflect multiple counting systems. Historically, archeologists have excluded a lot of things from their analyses, particularly the hand and symbolic notations Excluding these things limits the potential for analysis, so we need to be more flexible in deciding what counts as a material form. Perhaps the criterion ought to be things that fall within the idea of a visual epistemology for numbers, or things with a function in representing and manipulating numbers. This needs to be accompanied by more detailed analyses of the correspondences between material forms and numerical content, structure, and organization. Remember that when numbers emerge in contemporary societies, they take the form of gestures, descriptive phrases, and finger counting. Material forms like tallies come later, typically as perishable materials like wood and plant fibers. Unless prehistoric numeracy originated in a wholly different manner, and there's no good reason to assume that it did, this means that the archeological record can't and won't reveal the very first steps into numbers. This means that numerical developments must be inferred either from devices incorporated subsequent to the first numbers like tallies or from material forms marked for secondary non-numerical purposes like personal ornaments. We need to acknowledge this and then decide the characteristics and criteria by which we might infer numerical developments from subsequent and secondary forms. All the material record really shows at this point is that archaic humans made intentional marks behavior that intensified during the late Upper Paleolithic. This is still important for it signals the availability of behaviors and forms with the potential to be adapted to numerical purposes. A related question is whether tallies are necessarily the form used for bundling, the conventional grouping of values that makes representation more concise. Two circumstances suggest they would not be. First, apart from the Ishengo and Le Perdel bones, Prehistoric artifacts with linear marks lack numerical encoding. Possibly the tally is simply a form that is not easily adapted for value bundling, not like three-dimensional technologies are. Simply, grouping notches on tallies requires prior planning, while physical bundles of small objects are manipulable without prior planning. Besides the Mesopotamian tokens, these include beads, seeds, and shells. There are also forms of collaborative counting and counting by means of sorting. All of these instantiate higher productive grouping with place value, with amounts in the hundreds, thousands, and higher. Their association with complex cultures suggest such forms emerge under conditions of demographic increase, 
intergroup contact, or both, conditions that generally do not obtain prior to the Neolithic. Notably, they involve behaviors and material forms that would be unlikely to preserve, so they would be invisible to archeological investigations. Finally, we need to understand what material devices do in the historical realization of number concepts much better than we currently do, and use insights gained from contemporary material forms to understand the potential signs of prehistoric numeracy in the archeological record. Many insights can be gained from ethnographic data, not just from societies whose numbers are in the process of emerging, but also from societies whose numbers are highly elaborated, but not notationally mediated. In sum, numeracy is an ongoing creative enterprise, one shared across humanity that produces highly similar outcomes cross-culturally, whose variability can be traced to the different material decisions we make, and whose timing has been differently set by geographic and demographic factors. Understanding how the process works has the potential to inform archaeological investigations of prehistoric numeracy as yet another instance of this pan-human creative process. Now, before I take questions, I'd like to remind everyone that I'm an archaeologist who investigates human cognitive evolution using an extended mind perspective on cognition. So I won't have an opinion on things like Cantor's theory of infinite sets. However, if Brouwer was correct in seeing numbers as a function of the consciousness of self in time, we should also ask, what is the nature of the human mind? What primarily distinguishes our mind from that of all other species is the degree to which we leverage and incorporate material structures for cognitive purposes. So the idea that the mind is a system consisting of brain, body, and world may ultimately bear not only on how we realize and elaborate numerical concepts, but on their very nature as well. Thanks very much for your attention.